Welcome to The Twist, I'm Erica Gray. And today- I'm Ross Nichols. Ross Nichols, I'm introducing Ross Nichols, who is the author of the Moses Scroll. But first I'd like to say that we are at the 75th anniversary, which is being celebrated of Israel at the Jerusalem Post Conference 2023. So now that I got that out of the way, Ross, I would love for Ross to tell you about his book because we talk about Israel on this channel quite a bit and everyone knows about the Dead Sea Scrolls right. who follows Israel. But Ross is going to tell us about the Moses Scroll. Well, first of all, thanks for having me because uh, we met last year actually at the yes. same event. So the Moses Scroll is a fascinating story. It involves the story, as you mentioned, of a Dead Sea Scroll. But it's the one scroll that no one really knows about. So in 1865, this story is going to sound similar, Erica, to your audience, because really, if you think about it, everyone knows about the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in Qumran, 1946-47. This is 80 years before that but no one knew what the Dead Sea Scrolls were. So some Arabs go into a cave, they're fleeing from their enemies, and they're in Jordan, modern day Jordan, in the Wadi Mujib, the biblical river Arnon. Mm -hmm. They go into a cave, they see a bundle in the back that's kind of looks like just old tattered rags, but the Bedouin think maybe these are treasures. So they open quickly, open this up, and what they find Disappointingly, they find old leather strips coated in, well, they're coated in some sort of tar, asphalt substance, and then wrapped in linen. So they throw them down, they think they're worthless. But one of the Bedouin picks these up. He thinks maybe it's for good luck. He sees ancient writing, he can't read, takes them back to his tent. In 10 years, he keeps them. Becomes a wealthy man, owns lots of sheep, maybe wives, who knows, but he becomes wealthy. So ultimately, the story gets back to a Jerusalem shop owner by the name of Moses Wilhelm Shapira. Shapira, the shop owner, gets interested because he's a scroll merchant. So now remember, 80 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls, no one's seen these. So he, he sends letters to Europe. This is the short version, by the way. For the longer version, you have to read the whole book. Yes, but, have to read your yeah. interesting book. So the bottom line is, he takes the scrolls, he, he sends transcriptions, because it's written in Paleo-Hebrew, sends transcriptions to scholars in Germany. They dismiss it out of hand. There's no, no one has ever seen anything like this. So then he takes, five years later, he takes them to Germany, he takes them to Britain, it's the talk of, you would have loved to have interviewed him for your channel, because this is the news of the day. I mean, this is on every newspaper in England and Germany. Ultimately, the scrolls are called a forgery, Erica. The shop owner, the antiquarian Moses Shapira, goes to Amsterdam, he ends up in Rotterdam, and within one year from the time he reveals his scrolls, they find him dead in his hotel room. This is the story as I heard it back in 2019. But I kept thinking, why hasn't someone really dug into this story deeply? Yeah, why why was was he murdered? Well, was that's he, the was question. It natural causes? Most think he committed suicide, that he, he killed himself with a single shot. Uh, but there's some questions around that. There's some mystery involved. So what I decided to do was go back into the contemporary reports. I looked at mm -hmm. everything I could find. The British papers, the German papers. I'm not fluent in German, but we, we hired someone to translate these documents. And what we found was a story behind the story. The most fascinating, I've been studying biblical history and teaching the Bible and biblical Hebrew for many, many years, but this story captured my attention more than any other. Ultimately, I discovered through looking at the contemporary reports, I, I found the actual transcription of the manuscript. In other words, I wanted to see it in Hebrew. It is the most fascinating Where text. did you find that transcription? There are two places, Erica. One, 
Christian David Ginsburg is well known even today by students of Biblical Hebrew. He is probably one of the preeminent scholars of all time in the Masoretic text of the mm -hmm. Hebrew Bible. And, and he was the guy in England that was hired to look at the manuscript. Because this, if this is real, you understand the British Museum's willing to pay lots of money. Reports, now we, we're trying to confirm, reports are going around that this manuscript is being asked a million pounds. 1883, by the way. Wow. So a million pounds wow. would be like 120 million in, a, in modern day. So there's a lot resting on this. Is it real, is it not? Christian David Ginsburg. The whole story is mapped out in the book, but people ultimately declared it a forgery because they'd seen nothing like it. Now when, think about this, fast, and by the way, the other story, the rest of the scroll, so I got that transcription. I read it, I made my own copy of that, the Hebrew according to Christian David Ginsburg. Can you tell us a bit about what you read and how it yeah, differs? Yeah, yeah. What passages are in the scroll? Excellent question. So it immediately comes across as a version of Deuteronomy. It's shorter though. So the, the whole text, we can make it out. Now, by the way, there are two copies of the same manuscript that were mm -hmm. discovered, two copies. It represents, it's not exactly like our Deuteronomy though. So this particular manuscript contains about the size of the book of Hosea in the Bible. Okay. You know? So it's, it was 21 columns, each manuscript was 21 columns of text, and um, the, the, scroll, the strips, I wish I could, I'll describe it, about the size, each column is about the size of a postcard. The way this thing was designed, it was folded instead of rolled. It's on ancient, ancient leather strips, the writing is on one side, 21 columns in length. What it contains is, it contains part of the, uh, the journey from Horeb into uh, the eastern side, like where Moses and the children of Israel yes. crossed over. It contains uh, a version of the Ten Commandments that are different than we have in our really? Bible. Now, what is the reason for this? And what, what year do you date these at? What year do yep. you date them? Why the reason for the differences? Well, first of all, another great question. In our Bibles, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, we have, we have uh, one version of the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. the Ten Words, mm -hmm. in Exodus 20, one version in Deuteronomy 5. These two versions don't agree. So you have to wonder, well, which one represents the authentic? Now, most people believe that Deuteronomy is Moses retelling, so you're gonna have mm -hmm. some differences. But both of these accounts begin, these are the words that the Lord spoke unto the children of Israel, right? So um, why the differences? We have other versions found at the Dead Sea, among the Dead Sea Scrolls about the 10, you know, the various manuscripts, and they have differences as well. Now, some of the differences are very minor, but for instance, when the 10 words in this version are very different, one of the Ten Commandments in this version is the, the, we know it from Leviticus 19, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. It's very interesting. Interesting, and, exactly. And uh, the other thing is that each of these Ten Commandments end with the phrase, Anochi Elohim Elohecha, I am God your God. So it's sort of like a signature at the end of every one. You know, in, in different traditions, I don't know your audience that well, but whether they're uh, Christian or Jewish or all of the above, mm -hmm. there are uh, differences among the religious groups as to which, uh, how do you number them, right? Mm -hmm. For instance, a Catholic audience would split number nine and 10. Judaism splits the first commandment into two commandments, you mm -hmm. know? Now, what do we date them as? I would date them primarily to um, it, at least the first temple period. In other words, maybe towards the end of the first temple period. We have this legend, uh, this story that comes to us from the book of Maccabees, where in 2 Maccabees 2, Jeremiah at the end of the, the period sneaks across uh, the Ark of the Covenant and the law, and where does he put it? In a cave. Well, it just so happens that this is where this manuscript is discovered, in a cave east of the Jordan. 
So I would date the manuscript to that period of time, mm -hmm. which makes it extremely old. Dead Sea Scrolls, as your audience probably knows, date approximately 100 BCE to 100 CE, you know, BC and AD. Uh, but a f another guy, a scholar by the name of Don Dershowitz, uh, mm -hmm. he's one of the Harvard fellows, he wrote a book, came out two weeks after mine, on the Shapira scroll. It's called right. The Valediction of Moses. This manuscript, this scholar dates it to 957 BC or 957 BCE. We're talking about this would be, if proven authentic, would be absolutely, there would be nothing this old. Would be the wow. earliest manuscript of the biblical text. So where is it? Truth is, we're on a search. We're looking but for it right now. Before we get into this exciting right. search, because right. this is like Indiana Jones stuff. It is. I would have one question. Sure. Is there, what is the reason for the differing texts uh, as the scribes transpose them? Well, we, we have a, t I grew up in, uh, in church, very fundamentalist Christian background. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, there's this idea of the inerrancy of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So as a good young Baptist boy, you know, that's the way I grew mm -hmm. up, thanks to Mama and Granny. Baptist? Very, well, Southern. We okay, Southern, Southern Baptist, Baptist yeah. okay. But, but, you know, I've always loved the biblical text. And what I find is that it's fascinating to me that we have these different ancient versions. Mm -hmm. It lends, it lends, Erica, to the authenticity. If everything is precisely the same, uh, what I find interesting about the version you cited was that it actually sounds, uh, there's actually a quote, or similar to a quote, that Jesus made yep. talking about if you think something in your heart, then it's sin. And essentially you're saying that exactly, there's yeah. command of if you hate. Yep. I found that interesting. It paralleled with what it Jesus does. did. It does. In fact, a lot of people have pointed out, isn't it interesting that you have... Uh, Jesus talks about the greatest commandment is, mm -hmm. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And the second greatest commandment is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So many people have suggested a very similar comparison, as you just brought up, between this ancient document mm -hmm. and some sayings of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, um, you know, I, I personally think that there, there are some wonderful things that come out of this study. Number one, we know that there are differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, mm -hmm. and, and so you do have some differences like that. But, but what makes this document stand apart for me is that if we could find it and test it and prove that it is authentic, this, according to Don Dershowitz, who is mm -hmm. a very reputable scholar, this could prove to be sort of the document from which we get our manuscript mm -hmm. today. Like an earlier recension, you know, than, than the Deuteronomy even in our Bible. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating study, and, uh, and we are looking for it. So. Uh, now the right. exciting part, the Indiana Jones part. You are on a quest. Right. Tell us about that for finding these scrolls. So it, it is a quest, and it is sort of Indiana Jonesish. Jones. Oh, definitely. Can we say that? Hands so down. The, so the fun thing about this, when I first began studying this, my big question was, so where are they today? Mm -hmm. Because if if we in 1883, Erica, they didn't have the testing abilities. They didn't have. Uh, the scientific methodology that we have today. Mm -hmm. Now we've got it. Now we could read it. We could test it. Carbon dating, de you know, whatever. So the last known sighting. You know, if I lose my keys, mm -hmm. I have to ask my wife, "Have you seen my keys?" What's the first question you say? Where'd you see them last? So the last place the scrolls were found or seen uh, was in a place called Burton on Trent in England. Mm -hmm. The last known owner was a doctor by the name of Philip Brooks Mason. After Shapira dies, mm -hmm. the scroll fragments go up on the auction block. A famous, uh, a famous auctioner in England by the name of Sotheby's. By the way, if, if your audience knows about this, uh, the latest, it's called Sassoon 1053. It's, it's a manuscript that just sold. It was all in the news. $38 million. It's one of the oldest 
uh, copies of the Hebrew well, Bible. And I have Old a quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. When you mentioned what they were willing to pay for the scroll, yep. do you think that's why he was bumped off, possibly bumped off? It, well, you, they you, were looking, somebody was looking for the goods so that they could sell them? It could I mean, be. Is that a possibility? It, it could be. So remember, this is in the Netherlands in 1884, mm -hmm. March of 1884, and I've read the police reports. Uh, we've been to the Netherlands. We, we've done research in all these different, because we're looking for the clues. The death report, by the way, mm -hmm. there are several versions that hit the newspaper. Now you tell me if this doesn't raise your, your suspicions. One, he's found dead on the floor. One, he's found dead on the bed. Uh, it's a pistol. It's a revolver. It's a rifle. You, you know, all the stories are different. Wow. In, in the room, in the hotel room, uh, his, his bag, uh, he had business cards lying mm -hmm. around the floor. Uh, he had some manuscripts in uh, in his bag, you know, some Hebrew right. manuscripts. And so what, what would be the purpose? Well, you know, you see this wealthy guy, he's staying in a hotel, he's walking in and out. The only reason the guests noticed, where's Mr. Shapira? You know, they probably mm -hmm. met in the hotel for, for breakfast and they didn't notice he's missing. So they go into the room, they call mm -hmm. the police and find him dead. Don't know. I don't know yet if he killed himself or if he was uh, bumped off or mm -hmm. however you look at that. But uh, it is a mystery, so so we just don't know. Could be somebody that wanted to own the scrolls and didn't want to pay the price and figured it was cheap. I mean, there's Maybe so many Maybe they thought he had them with him, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, he was a well-known celebrity. Again, this is the talk of every newspaper at the yes. time. And uh, and so we we just don't know that piece, but but when you when you look at all the facts and you mm -hmm. you know so we're what we're looking for first of all the manuscript. Remember we have the English transcription done by Christian Ginsberg. Right. We also have the German edition that was published by Hermann Goethe mm -hmm. in 1883. Uh, I took that book, which was originally only in German, and the Tylers, you know Dave and Patty, we translated through their institute. They have a language institute. I worked with a German wow. translator. That book is also available. It's called Fragments of a Leather Manuscript. So you have the, the book, The Moses Scroll, which tells the whole story. Me, who published, yep. uh, who is Horeb the author Press. of that? Press. I wrote that one as okay, well. Okay, well, yeah. actually, you're going to want to check out our Amazon store. We have our guest books. Yep. I will add that book as well. Very good. To uh, our Amazon store. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a thriller. The Moses Scroll is a page turner. I, I had never written a book when I when I set out to research this, but I was mm -hmm. compelled to write it because the story truly needed to be told. Mm -hmm. It was it's a mystery that is unsolved to this day. Right. It's a it's a great mystery, mm -hmm. and that's what we're looking for right now. So we're looking for. The what is your greatest uh, discovery so far? Is there, or maybe there isn't one. Do you have anything that's given you some real hope, or has it all just been difficult? It's, well, anything worthwhile is difficult, right? So we know that. But every bit of this is rewarding, but I'll tell you, the, the most thrilling part of this is, to this day, it's unsolved. And, and mm -hmm. there's an international team working on it right now. So I have a friend in Australia who's a researcher. I have a friend in Germany. I have a friend in England. I've worked with the PEF, the Palestine Exploration Fund. We've gone to Germany to the uh, Staatsbibliothek, which is the German state right. library. Right. And, and what we're doing is we're assembling all the facts. I'm working on two other books right now about the very same subject. But, but I think what's fascinating is people say, well, you don't have the manuscript. And we don't have the physical manuscript. But what we do have is the text of the manuscript. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and it's in the book, by the that's way. That's amazing text is that in you there. would even have that. So you have something that shows the validity of this. That's right, that's right. And it, it makes sense in so many ways that we would have a more ancient record. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't know this. Going back to my upbringing, our current Bibles, uh, particularly, let's talk just Old Testament. Right. The Hebrew Bible, I'm a teacher of the Hebrew Bible, and my faith is based in the Hebrew Bible. But, but what's interesting mm -hmm. is, is that this, 
Uh, the oldest manuscript that we have of mm -hmm. the Old Testament, other than the Dead Sea Scrolls, right. is uh, dates to roughly a thousand A.D. or a thousand of the Common okay. Era. Now, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, you take that back to two thousand years old. You know. Mm -hmm. But this manuscript would be even older, Erica. Wow. We're talking 500 wow. years older than the earliest manuscript. So do I have hope that we'll find it? This is the most thrilling part of this is it is possible. It's, it's, better, it's a better chance than a needle in a haystack, let's say, because we're following the clues. It's just like mm -hmm. uh, it's just like an investigation, a cold case. I call it the most controversial case in the history of biblical scholarship. Now, what's funny is is that when my book came out, it didn't get immediate attention the first couple of days. But again, two weeks to the day, New York Times front page, mm -hmm. Shapira manuscript. Was it real? Edan Dershowitz, the Harvard scholar, published right on the heels of mine, and it sent the scholarly world into a wow. turmoil. So then my book was reviewed, and lots of people have read it, thank God. Uh, but it is truly, and he, here's the main thing. I almost feel as if I have to defend Shapira's honor, mm -hmm. because since 1883, when people say Moses Shapira, they always add, you mean the forger? Well, what if it was wow. real? Erica, what if it was real? Because he kept saying, no, it's not fake. It's look, I, mm -hmm. now think about the similarities. Found in a cave by Bedouin. Dead Sea Scrolls, found in a cave by Bedouin. Near the Dead Sea, near the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. Wrapped in, uh, wrapped in uh, linen coated with this black sticky substance. The same as the Dead Sea wow. Scrolls. And it's written in ancient Paleo-Hebrew. So you have to wonder, what could this possibly be? You know, I mean, it, I think it is absolutely the oldest biblical manuscript that's ever been discovered. Well, for you to, I mean, you're basically putting your life into this, and you're just this walking encyclopedia. Oh, I love it. The text on the scrolls, and, and I can feel your zeal just yeah. being next to you and seeing yeah. in your eyes the passion. Yeah, it, it's, it's a passion, and that's a good way to put it. I wasn't looking for this. Mm -hmm. I'm a Bible teacher. I, you know, I teach biblical Hebrew. I, you know, I even have a, a Hebrew vocabulary book on Amazon so people can learn biblical Hebrew themselves. I teach Hebrew. I teach about. I didn't have time for this, you know. Wow. But it just it knocked me off my feet. You know, when I first heard about it, I said, "What? Where's the scroll now? What did it say?" I read books by other authors. And they didn't even give the text, but I did. I, that was my main. I wanted to know what it said, so I got the book. Uh, every book I could find on it, every newspaper. I, I, my story tells it from the beginning to the mm -hmm. end, documenting every detail of it. The text is the Hebrew text is in there. Some of your viewers who study Hebrew, the Hebrew text is there with footnotes, and my English translation of this text is in the book, so it gives it all. Wow. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because um, we could be looking at the, the the foundation of our body. I mean, it's that. That possible. is exciting! Wow, and what an honor to have you, of all people, on this show here today. I just appreciate you giving me an opportunity to tell the story. I know when we met before, your story is fascinating, and and just. The fact that we run into each other again, it's providential, you know? Absolutely, and I'm so excited that we've just done this interview. So, the book is The Moses Scroll, and also, I'm going to have Ross's entire library on uh, recommended. So, if you're interested in Hebrew, be sure to also check out his book on Hebrew. And thank you, Ross, for being on the show. Please check out the link below. And... Um, it's an honor. Thanks for having me and thanks to all your viewers because I appreciate, I know that time is valuable and the fact that they would take time to listen to the story of Moses Shapira 
read the book, The Moses Scroll. It's really a fascinating story. And not just because I wrote it. It's a fascinating <laughs> story. It really oh, is. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's the stuff that movies are made of. This is Indiana Jones adventure kind there of There are talks story. right now about a feature film or maybe a documentary on this. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. So, folks, if you don't subscribe to The Twist News, be sure to subscribe. Check out Ross's book. And until next time, stay tuned.